Uh, thank you, General Swan. It's a pleasure to see you. It's great to be back at the AUSA uh, building and see some uh, uh, dear friends and colleagues uh, still uh, uh, serving our nation uh, in uniform. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, just by way of uh, personal introduction, I spent 38 years in the military in Army medicine, uh, finished up my career uh, leading MRMC and Fort Detrick, and then the, uh, a tour as Army Deputy Surgeon General, and then finishing up as a Joint Staff Surgeon. Since then, I've uh, been the President and CEO of the Henry Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine, and that is a congressionally authorized uh, not-for-profit whose mission is to advance military medicine. So this concept of uh, military medicine and, and helping our troops become more uh, resilient, agile, and survivable is the uh, main focus uh, for me as I continue my second career. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, the three, I, I think, uh, outstanding uh, senior leaders in Army medicine to talk uh, to us uh, about uh, aspects of readiness, uh, recruiting in, uh, from the trauma, and other operational-focused uh, currency and proficiency aspects. Uh, first is uh, Colonel uh, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Duque. Uh, she works at uh, OTSG, and she is a Deputy Medical Corps Chief. Just by way of background, she's a Lehigh University uh, graduate, got her Bachelor's of Science uh, degree from Lehigh, and was an ROTC Distinguished Military graduate. She got her medical degree from USU in 2003, is an Army War College uh, graduate, and specialty-wise, uh, she's a family medicine uh, uh, specialist with a geriatric sub, uh, subspecialty. Uh, next, we have uh, Colonel uh, Dr. Jason Seely, Siri, who's uh, at the Medical Center of Excellence, uh, Medical Corps Chief Proponent Officer. Uh, he's the, also the Trauma and Critical Care Consultant to the Surgeon General. Now, what's interesting uh, with Jason is uh, he's uh, uh, initially enlisted, is an Air Defender, uh, got up to the rank, uh, uh, outstanding rank of Staff Sergeant uh, before he went on through ROTC to get his bachelor's degree. Uh, from the University of Tampa, also a DMG, got his uh, MD from the University of South Florida, Army War College graduate, and his specialty is general surgery. Uh, next, we have Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Danielle Holt, uh, who is the Division Chief for General Surgery at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and is an Assistant Professor of Surgery at USU. Uh, finally, she's a President of the Excelsior Surgical Society and part of the MH. SSPACS. She has an AB uh, in biology from Harvard uh, and uh, is an ROTC DMG from uh, MIT, which, uh, which provides the ROTC program for that, for those uh, um, uh, consortium of universities. She got her medical degree from Vanderbilt, is also an Army War College graduate, and her specialty is general surgery. All right, I'm going to dispense with opening comments. We'll have time at the end for closing comments and go right into our questions. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, by way of background, how long did it take us to ramp up an adequate level of trauma care in the Iraq and Afghanistan theaters of operations? Uh, can or should we expect something similar in future wars? And can we afford to have it ramp up at all? Uh, and, and just uh, parenthetically, each new challenge will naturally bring a ramp up period as seen in COVID. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and tackle this one. Uh, thank you, sir. And thank you, General Dingle and General Brown and AUSA for this opportunity to speak. So when we talk about the time to ramp up to the level of trauma. One thing I'd like to highlight is that particularly in OIF and OE, OEF, we had unprecedented levels of survival with increasing um, injury severity. So greater than 90%. So we want to capture you know, sort of those wins and lessons learned. And so we look at the ramp up period, what, what previous, um, conflicts have, have demonstrated anywhere between six months to a year, it will take the team to become acclimated to the operational environment to build up to that level of proficiency. Um, kind of two phenomena. So not only, you know, when we look at this, this peak, peak performance, um, it has a temporal component to it also. So this is called either the peacetime effect or the walker dip. And essentially what that means is as you get into theater, you know, it takes, it takes time to gel with the gel with your team, understand your, your limitations of your environment, your equipment um, to build that. And you see that, that sort of um, waveform of proficiency kind of over the cycle as teams rotate. And so with that, you know, 
in future conflicts without, you know, I think the key there is that we're, I think we know that we're going to have probably less time to be able to develop um, and build up to this level of proficiency. And ultimately, we want to lessen the sort of duration and intensity of that dip for buildup. All right. Uh, um, uh, that's very helpful. Let me ask this follow on question. What will the future battlefield look like in a transregional, multi domain, multifunctional conflict? It's the middle one, third time. Uh, just real quick again, uh, General Swan, thanks for having us here, uh, Lieutenant General Dingle and uh, Sergeant Major Huff. Again, appreciate your, uh, your support and trust over the years and pass the same on to uh, General Brown. Um, so I will say, I, I'll add to this, we kind of answered this already earlier today with our, with our opening and, and Major General Robinson and, and uh, the uh, Brigadier General, um, why am I drawing, uh, McQueen, sorry, from uh, our MRDC mentioned that it's going to be much different than what we've experienced in the past. And so while we know what it took to get everything started uh, for the current war and, and how that went over the last 20 years would be different. Uh, main thing, it's going to be functioning more at the division level for command and control than at the brigade level. Uh, so that does impact us at the medical side. Uh, I think it's going to be uh, much more dispersed uh, than what we're used to and much more mobile. We're not going to hang out a lot of combat outposts and just be a target. Uh, and although we have mobile units, they've uh, over the last 20 years pretty much functioned in a fixed facility and grown accustomed to that. A very resource limited we're going to have to learn how to do more with less, be able to do better planning and uh, anticipate less uh, coming. We, uh, both of our uh, OEF and OIF, we went with our initial um, 72 hours worth of uh, initial entry patient care packages uh, with good um, resupply. Uh, that's not what we're, and then after that, we would fall in on um, facilities that had multiple connexes full of stuff to take care of hundreds and hundreds of patients. And so supply could never show up for a year and we would have been fine. We won't, we will not be experiencing that. Uh, the uh, increase in electronics and technology and communications uh, will be uh, hopefully advantageous until we have a cyber attack, emergency war, uh, electronic warfare, EMP, or something that, that will throw us off. So I think we need to remember how to do things. Uh, same with the GPS and the compass. We still have to know how to do things with paper uh, and less. The sea uh, burn, which uh, again, in the 80s, 90s, that was the big thing, uh, early 90s at least, that we trained on. Uh, in the military and hasn't been talked about much. And so uh, returning to this uh, high energy weaponry not, and figuring out how we're going to manage that's going to look a little bit different uh, since we don't have that. Uh, the good thing we think is with increased intelligence, that's the best preventative medicine, not being at the wrong place at the wrong time. If you don't have a hole, we don't have to plug the hole. Uh, and then uh, increased body armor and, and other uh, equipment that's being developed. I'll tell you also what the C did, what we can say in this, uh, this, uh, Form, sir, uh, venue is that we are looking at redesigning. Uh, we, we have our known knowns right now for role one, two, and three. Uh, and some of them just went through a redesign, but looking farther down the road, uh, there is going to be some redesign probably at the role two surgical and definitely at the role three. Uh, we have a different design looking at uh, something that's specific for the division area and for the core area and for theater areas. We know evacuation will be different, not being able to get people out back to the state side. And then how do we return them to duty in the in the theater instead of just returning them to duty as a, as a general um, uh, soldier. So I think those are the, the key things. And, and one last uh, set of things I was thinking about uh, earlier today as we did this, we have a lot of great secondary programs that are out there. Uh, when we have um, soldiers that are injured that might be um, catastrophic and we can't care for them, we, we hold on to them to be organ donors, uh, to do sperm harvesting, uh, we talked about the ECMO and stuff like that. That's become part of our culture. And uh, when we have the large mass cows and, uh, and challenges with evacuation, we may have to tone that back, uh, step throttle that back because we won't have the resources. So a little bit of expectation management as we move into large scale combat operations. Uh, in the past wars, uh, we prided ourselves on the uh, golden hour uh, and getting to uh, a surge, surgeon for resuscitation just as soon as possible. Uh, that put a, a great stress on the uh, evacuation uh, chain and on the supply of uh, uh, expertise on the battlefield. Um, and uh, with the war on terror, uh, I would anticipate that we'll continue to have uh, disaggregated, widely dispersed units that would uh, require surgical backup support. Uh, how can we extend the reach of surgeons in the battlefield to initiate resuscitation in these austere environmental uh, situations? 
All right, so I'll take that one. Um, I also will extend my thanks to General Dingle, General Brown, General Slan. Thank you for having us. Um, so extending our reach uh, of our surgeons is really more about extending our capabilities than necessarily extending a personnel. While we, we just don't have enough surgeons where uh, to put everywhere that we want them. Um, so while we have increased our surgical force structure, our um, force uh, forward ready uh, resuscitative surgical detachments, FSRDs, uh, FRSDs, uh, recently, and have modernized them and are looking to continue to modernize them to make them more uh, able to split, go forward and um, cross cover each other. Uh, we really need to look at how do we extend the capabilities of our surgeons. And that's really, Sergeant Major Huff touched on it, our medics, our um, 62 Bravos, which is our field surgeon slots, our 65 Deltas, our uh, PAs, the ones who are at the role one units and keeping them trained on those uh, what we call ICTLs, but they're just tr critical trauma skills that will extend somebody's, uh, a soldier's life to get them back to um, a role two surgical capability, role three surgical capability. And that's really where our efforts are going to be. All right, so uh, um, those are good points on how you can provide non-surgeon support, kind of extend the reach or restart resuscitation before you, act, you get to an actual surgeon, whether you, you're, you're uh, using blood versus uh, crystalloid, et cetera, so you're buying time, if you will. So to uh, uh, Jason, since you, you run this trauma or had run the trauma program in the past, how do you best provide surgical support in these scenarios of small disaggregated, widely dispersed units? Yes, sir. I'll do that. And again, I I'll, will I'll reiterate with, with Sergeant Major Huff here is that the key thing to this is um, providing the life saving interventions as far forward as we can so that when they eventually show up for advanced resuscitation and in, in surgery, that they're in a better condition or we have more people arriving uh, alive and in a better condition. Now, once that happens, um, th then we have our, our surgical team there. There's a couple of different things that, uh, that we can do that we've looked at over the years. Uh, one with the uh, force design update that we had from a Ford surgical team to a Ford resuscitative surgical detachment is that within the detachment, we can have breakaway elements. So the resuscitative team that now has its own um, emergency physician, they can move far forward. They're designed to be a breakaway element uh, and not just be stuck with that 10 or 20 person team uh, to help to provide uh, some better uh, treatment. The trauma surgeons uh, or, or the trauma providers themselves need to be better trained uh, and competent with resuscitation, this uniqueness of trauma surgery and trauma critical care on the battlefield, especially again with the evacuation piece being a problem, not only showing up uh, later in their uh, trauma sequelae to the surgical team, but we may not be able to get rid of them in our normal doctrinal four to six hours, which historically was less than one hour uh, for most of the uh, the time, that, for at least from 2008 to 2014 in both theaters. Uh, we may have to hold on to them for days. And so that's completely different from doing a quick post-op management to real critical care at, at a shorter element. So making sure that people understand uh, the difference on that. I think the other piece again is a cultural change. We we have um we all know to circle C on the test for the proper way to conduct triage or mass cal on a multiple choice, but we really haven't had to do that uh, for the most part for the last 20 years because we've had such a an impressive amount of resources uh, both from people and equipment and through evacuation. So I think really going back and honing the historical um, skills that we had with good triage. And within the mass cow, not being afraid to make somebody expectant. We've gotten away from using the E word. Uh, and that's going to, I think, be a reality that, that we'll have to get into that. And, and the last, I, th I think, to help support when they're uh, out there is uh, having some augmentation teams. We've dabbled with that with non-doctrinal uh, evacuation teams uh, in the past that eventually became our, our JEC, our in route critical care folks. But maybe having a small um, uh, critical care elements or prolonged field teams that can augment our classic role one, role two, uh, and maybe the role threes that we have in the future, uh, because every site won't need one. And so for structure reasons, we could keep it low, but just have them so that they're available instead of ad hoc. Uh, thank you. So one of the, uh, the wins of these conflicts is uh, the, the trust that the infantryman has uh, put in the medical community to uh, 
uh, resuscitate uh, and save uh, troops who are injured in, in combat. Uh, and what we heard here the last couple of uh, responses is, is how the surgeons, what the surgeons can do uh, on the battlefield and what we can do that would augment surgical resuscitation to extend time until you got to see a surgeon. Now to speak about the surgeon itself, uh, uh, and I do applaud Army Medicine for moving towards uh, uh, the concept that bigger army is using, whether a field artillery man or an infantryman or whatever, uh, or uh, uh, aviator, the idea of currency and proficiency. Uh, and in the past, we have seen, just assumed if you're a physician, you're good to go. And operational readiness is not the same as hospital clinical readiness. So with the idea of with the currency and proficiency across Army Medicine, um, this one I'll, leave, I'll, I'll pass. Um, uh, first, I'll, I'll, I'll have you take this, uh, Liz, and then uh, ask our academic uh, to re respond as well. Do we have the level of currency and profici proficiency across Army Medicine that we had at the height of the war? Is that maintained currently? And if not, why not? And what are we doing about it? So I think it depends on what angle you look at um, our proficiency through. Um, I think we've talked about uh, General Harder and the Medical Generating Force uh, panel talked about how our, we use some of our skills in the COVID response, such as our uh, uh, building, our response, uh, uh, our resourcing and patient uh, uh, monitoring and our supply chain. Uh, our army trauma system is loads better than it was at the height of the war because we have spent 20 years building that system up. But if you're talking about our individual skill sets for our surgeons, um, I think that the answer is probably no, because we are not doing trauma surgery all the time in all of our force generating platforms. And I think Danielle can add a little bit of that. But if you're talking about our critical care capabilities, I think our ICU docs have been used very heavily in the last year and a half, two years with the COVID response. So again, I think it depends on which lens you look at it through. Um, Danielle. Sure. So from the, the clinical readiness perspective, you know, there's sort of two components to that. So I think about it, you know, both from the acuity standpoint. So we need to have sets and reps with patients that have severe sort of physiologic derangement that, you know, these patients typically require intense resources and it's in its time constrained. So that's one component, but then there's also this complexity component. So, you know, patients, depending on their other sort of medical problems, as well as the technical complexity that goes into the particular procedure that they're having done. And so at Uniform, I'm assigned at Uniform Services University, uh, we were directed by Health Affairs to develop um, a readiness metric. So this is called the, the KSA metric, which stands for knowledge, skills, and abilities. And essentially what we're doing with this metric is how do we, how do we sort of classify or quantify the workload that, you know, not just the surgeons, but the entire combat casualty care team, you know, does at our hospitals or military um, training platforms, you know, how do we capture that and then translate in, that into the skills that we need in the operational environment? And so essentially I would think about KSA as a sort of a, um, it's more of a measure of performance. So it utilizes um, elements of medical coding to sort of capture the more uh, complex cases. Um, and what we found, there was a recent article um, in a JAMA surgery in October of this year. And so as we've been looking at this metric over time, I think, you know, there are multiple challenges that, you know, that we're facing and in meeting this, uh, you know, combination of things, meeting the, the requirements for the COVID pandemic, you know, national shortages um, in it, staffing shortages across our hospitals. We're seeing that these KSAs and the number of procedures that, that um, surgeons, as it was first developed for general surgeons, has gone down about a quarter. And so it's, it's something where we need to, you know, certainly optimize. So I'm going to add in back into the, we talk KSAs in the joint world, the army talks ICTLs, and I've mentioned that a little bit earlier. Um, and so that we have been working very digitally, diligently over the last two years or so um, in generating or creating our ICTLs for our medical providers, because it's something that I know our enlisted folks have done for decades. We have never taken that approach, so it's relatively new to us, but looking at what tasks, what are the individual tasks, and we define them as our low volume, high risk procedures. So those things that we don't do on a day-to-day -day basis in our, our daily mission um, that we need to do in our operational environment. Um, and those are soon to be codified in the trade-off standards and then uh, we'll start the implementation process in the next year or so. 
So this is a question for any one of you all. Uh, should the Army move towards uh, only training general surgeons? So uh, I'll answer that. The, uh, so um, I have two different hats here. I work for the two different generals and then there's Jason speaking. So I think the answer is uh, no. And the reason is because we do have pediatric trauma on the battlefield. That's not our, our main focus. Uh, that were funded for by Congress, but we do have collateral damage, and that's just from the uh, the beginning beginning of warfare. I think also when we look at our uh, challenges that we have with recruiting and retention, there are individuals out there that have a specific desire for what they want to do. Same in the aviation world, which airframe they might want to fly, uh, but then what they actually are able to perform on the battlefield. So an example is a pediatric surgeon or a, a, a transplant surgeon or some of these other things. Uh, if we can draw in those high quality uh, individuals. Uh, that have really great skills and they're, and they're very cerebral and good thinkers with problem solving. Uh, and, but they're also interested enough to wear the uniform and do everything they need to do to be uh, deployable and, and do trauma on the battlefield. Then I think that's a great mix. I think in the ideal world, just for our uh, deployed mission, uh, all trauma surgeons would be the best type of surgeon to have. That's not the reality for the resources that we have. And we have it uh, a mostly garrison mission. And, and last thing I'll say is if we, if we, the army are doing our job, right, we'll stay in cooperation and competition and out of armed conflict. So we won't need all the trauma surgeons. So, so I'm going to jump in as the non-surgeon on this panel. Um, absolutely not. We 80, over 80% of what we do downrange is DMBI d disease, non-battle injury. You need your family medicine. You need your pediatrics. We saw, I, I think another panel member spoke how much our OBs and our PEDs were used with the Afghanistan, Afghanistan refugee mission. Um, so we need that broad, diverse scope of uh, backgrounds and skill sets to be able to take care of our soldiers, our families and everybody else. So everyone uh, should have a readiness specialty to which they are maintaining their skills uh, for deployment purposes. Yes, I think th absolutely. Okay. So uh, um, is there a place in army medicine for uh, uh, radiation oncologists? So actually, you picked the the one that we have decided to uh, re retire, but um, or <laughs> get rid of. <laughs> but no. So while yes, most of our um, our AOCs have readiness requirements, and you know we use the example of. Uh, Oh, some of our specialists deploy, our dermatologists, our allergists deploy as 62 Bravos, a field surgeon, um, because they have that internal medicine background. We have, we, we've talked about our generating force, how we train our doctors, and there are certain skill sets that we require in our generating platforms that may not have that direct operational mission, but we still need them because we need to have, uh, uh, we need to train our own. And so it, that is an important tie-in as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, kind of getting back to our uh, surgical specialty, uh, what are the most effective training programs and environments for trauma medical care? Jason, I'll let you take that. Uh, thank you, and I, I think one of my colleagues can augment this. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, stay out of the clinical uh, realm of the MTS and talk about the other piece. My favorite is uh, the operational side, so more the force comes, so calm. So I think that um, once we get the foundational um, clinical skills that we need and then our extra skills that you, you really have to understand how to do operational medicine. It's different. Again, if it's a rotary wing or fixed wing civilian versus the, uh, the military, it's a completely different um, mission set, although the, the vehicles look the same. So it's the same for us. So we need to learn how to do our clinical practice guidelines, our operational medicine um, that, that's different. And we do that by being integrated with our field teams. This has been um, sort of streamlined lately with the, uh, the change from the PROFUS to the uh, M2 assigned personnel that General Harder had brought up. Uh, we, we're coming up on about uh, year three of that right now. And that, um, so we have people more integrated. And then our courses that we have, we have official um, uh, program of record courses that they'll go through if it's the TCMC or BCT3 for surgeons. I uh, use the ATTC as our primary one. We have a pilot program uh, called Stark, which is being uh, ran out of BAMC right now. There's a few other programs within special operations and our role three course just uh, was redesigned uh, to be focused on the field hospital. But I think the important thing is that uh, we're so used to in the hospital, 
uh, of somebody else maintaining the equipment and knowing how it all works. And when we deploy, you're, you're one deep in almost every specialty on these small teams that we're talking about. So you have to know the full operational capability of that piece of equipment, if it's monitoring or if it's for use. You also have to know how to troubleshoot it and, and do your daily maintenance, the PMCS on it, if you will. Uh, which most physicians and nurses are not used to doing because there's somebody else in the hospital that's based off that we do. And, and last thing I'd like to throw in is with the, uh, the H2F, you know, setting up the tents and tearing them down. We train for that in our, uh, when we're with the 82nd. Some of our forward surgical teams were embedded in our initial deployers, the 82nd, the 101st, and the 2nd ACR, uh, but they're all now in, under the med brigades. Uh, and, and we would train for that, but we haven't done that on the battlefield in 20 years. And so when we look at having to be mobile every 24 hours or so um, to stay out of somebody's satellite or electronic areas, that, that's a... Um, a different um, concept. And we need everybody to know how to fill the sandbags. Somebody mentioned uh, how to do the slit trench. Oh, I was a, the a, uh, and a cat hole, the a, uh, field sanitation team, everyone I was younger. So I think there's a lot of um, operational things we need to know uh, to make us a great team instead of just a good team. All right, I heard a lot about uh, uh, training, simulation, uh, didactic work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for uh, Colonel Holt, do MTFs have any uh, relevance anymore for readiness training? So absolutely. I mean, our, our MTFs are essentially our readiness platforms. And so, you know, we kind of talked earlier about from the, you know, force generation standpoint, you know, all of the components that go into main, just developing these clinical specialties and being able to achieve their board certifications. And so when we talk about, you know, from the ICTL perspective or from the, the joint KSA perspective, I would think about sort of the clinical foundation uh, in the generating force as, be, as being provided at our MTFs. And so, you know, with that, there are military unique um, curriculum that we get, you know, through that training in a military platform versus if we train in a civilian sector that we have to be able to, to, to develop that gap if we don't have the MTFs as our readiness platforms. And so that really needs to be optimized first and foremost. And then when you look at from a, um, for sustainment, you know, that's really where your clinical practice, you know, this using uh, the idea of assessing your, your daily workload and its relevance to the deployed environment in the, sort of a continuous cycle. And so the way we would describe it from the clinical readiness program, which utilizes this KSA metric, is that you, you sustain sort of your clinical activity. Um, you ideally want to, to move your practice towards things that are going to improve your ability to provide combat casualty care. So in the MTFs, that would be you know, our emergency care, our, our surgical services, our intensive care. And what that does is then enables the entire team within the MTF, all of the services that, that, that feed into those. So things like um, blood bank utilization, um, our lab, you know, laboratory, radiology, being able to you know, exercise those teams in the care of acute um, complex patients. Um, you know, util utilizing, as we look at this metric, you can measure it over time. And then we want to augment that, you know, with, with that gap. So the skills that we've, you know, the hard learned lessons that we've learned in combat, you know, that we typically don't see in our routine day-to-day -day practice, uh, in partnership, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit with the American College of Surgeons, we've developed a military specific curriculum uh, that, that targets those combat casualty care skills so that one, our surgeons, um, over 200 surgeons have taken a knowledge assessment that looks at those that particular skill set, as well as a competency-based practical skills assessment. So, you know, in my day-to-day -day practice, I'm not doing the types of surgeries, um, damage control surgeries, you know, specific trauma procedures. And what we, what the Uniform Services University has developed is a program. Uh, it is called Asset Plus, and so advanced surgical skills um, for exposure and trauma, where essentially we're using perfused cadavers uh, to to perform these procedures to the level and the standard of a trauma surgeon. So you have one-on-one -on -one instruction with a trauma surgeon uh, that who then assesses the skills. And what we found is that though that skill set, one can be trained in a two-day uh, training classroom and that over time, it, it appears that those skills, uh, they wax and they wane, but they, that about a two year period is where we start to see those skills start to decline. And so, you know, if we can maintain this life cycle of clinical practice in our MTFs, coupled with, you know, sort of this gap of military specific knowledge and then a practical skills assessment, you know, for our services uh, or specialties rather that, that have this, um, you know, skill set. 
Okay. The um, uh, I I would imagine that the caseload and the uh, mix case mix and the MTFs are are just not adequate uh, uh, for the folks to have hands on experience to augment the the KSA uh, work that you have. And there there's got to be a public private partnership. Can one of you all tell me? about where Army Medicine is going with this, uh, whether surgery or non-surgery, how are we helping folks uh, remain exposed to a clinical practice uh, that uh, whose skills that they can take downrange with them? Well, I'll go ahead and speak and we have our uh, oversight, uh, both with uh, General Harder and uh, Lieutenant General Dingle here. So I think there's uh, different things. I'll speak maybe to the MILSA partnerships and you can speak to the the other partnership, Daniel. So um, we, we've uh, worked with industry or with our civilian partners uh, for decades uh, for residency training, for medics to get uh, uh, sets and reps and, and other things. But starting with the uh, NDA uh, 17, we had section 708 where it very specifically said that we can embed forward surgical teams or similar elements uh, with our partners and uh, civilian partners. There was a little modification in the 2019 NDA that opened up the aperture of what types of hospitals. But would you, I will tell everyone here that the Army took a very aggressive approach to this uh, at the time and uh, looked at what we wanted to do uh, more so than our sister services. And we've been able to um, create, I think we have 10 programs at this time uh, and we've uh, grown and evolved. Uh, we originally had a vision of about 15 programs. We're right-sizing it at this time. And originally with the design of having our uh, professional fillers, our profis providers work at these high volume level one trauma centers, and then they could um, um, be sponsors for the rest of the individuals on the Ford surgical team to rotate through, or if they were on a combat support hospital, uh, we would have liked to have seen it so that a uh, force com completely embedded the full 20 person team. And we're just not to that point yet. It's still, uh, uh, it's not in its infancy, but the program is still evolving and it's very foreign uh, to the uh, um, uh, force communists to envision having somebody not uh, on the basis where they are. But these programs uh, provide some of the highest volume and complex cases uh, that we have in the U.S., and we get to be part of it. And the uh, return on investment is pretty good because it's at no cost to us. There's always a cost of PCSing. There's a little bit of a cost of not having certain providers in our MTFs. Um, but the hospital, there's, there's no charge. Uh, it's already been built, if you will, and, and we are able to... Uh, uh, integrate. And, and then the last thing is it follows along in line with the uh, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The NASM put out a report, very long name, but the short name was the Zero Preventable Deaths. And really looking at how can the DOD and our civilian sector integrate to improve outcomes uh, in, the, in the U.S. and on the battlefield. And this is one of the things that we're doing where we share our military medicine, and they've incorporated a lot of it uh, into the civilian sector. But we also get to see what's the latest and greatest in our uh, uh, premier academic centers and, and transfer back. And then I think we have another partnership that's a little bit different if you want to speak to that. Sure, so from the academic side, um, we have what's called the MHS PAC. So the Military Health System Strategic Partnership with the American College of Surgeons. Which is, a, which is a novel strategic partnership where essentially we're leveraging you know, national experts in education and training, systems development and research um, to be able to augment you know, the care that we're able to provide at the MTFs with these other sort of knowledge products is how I would think about that. Um, from an education and uh, training standpoint, we talked a little bit about the Asset Plus course, but particularly from the systems development side. So the partnership with the American College of Surgeons has, has helped us develop our joint trauma system you know, over the last 20 years. It's also helped us uh, develop a DOD, what's called the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. So this is NISQIP for short. So what this is, is a nationally benchmarked, it looks at um, over 700 civilian hospitals participate in this. Uh, all 44 of our DOD um, hospitals participate and they're essentially looking at the surgical outcomes um, it, that are provided so that we can provide excellent care for our patients in our MTFs. And so with that, we found that six of our hospitals are in the top 10% nationally, you know, which really emphasizes the quality of care that we're able to deliver in the, in the military health system. And if you can sort of leverage those national experts, you know, we start talking about research, DOD funds, you know, over 80% of trauma research. And so it's critical that we, you know, combine all of these components. Um, the American College helped us put together uh, what they call the blue book. And so what that is is sort of best practices for developing these military civilian partnerships so that we can develop this sort of bi-directional military to civilian 
learning healthcare organization so that, you know, during times of conflict, you know, the civilian sector learns, you know, much from us. And then during peacetime, you know, we can, we can develop those same skills from our civilian partners that are engaged, um, you know, in high volume, high acuity trauma. And so, you know, from that perspective, when we look at the MTFs as the readiness platforms, it sort of gives us this three-pronged approach of, of, how do you, of how do you enhance the readiness, uh, the level of care that we provide that contributes to readiness. And so one is recapturing, so bringing back cases or surgical, not just surgical cases, but all of the cases that contribute to this complexity and acuity back to our military treatment facilities. Um, looking for opportunities to expand. So, you know, the, the VA is a natural partner for us. The, you know, these are our patients throughout their life cycle of their time in service um, and after. And so being able to offer more care to our, to our VA beneficiaries. And then in select cases, uh, looking at opportunities for our hospitals to become trauma centers. So, you know, this is very market and sort of geographically dependent uh, based on, you know, the other resources, you know, in the area, um, but being becoming, we have seven uh, facilities that are currently either verified by the American College of Surgeons or by their states as trauma centers. It brings those sets and reps back into the MTS. And then sort of lastly, you know, then, then looking at these partnerships to expand. So it's really this kind of building from the, the MTFs as the foundation, and then, you know, all the way up to our civilian partners to maintain that readiness. All right. Thank you. I, I am mindful of time. Let me uh, see if I can get this uh, question from the audience in uh, looking for a quick answer from, from any or all of you all. What is your appetite for uh, augmented reality uh, VR training to expedite or bolster skill building? Does that fall within the scope of sim simulation training? Yes. Yeah, so actually our core chief is very interested in that um, as far as uh, one, she had me look into it for a recruitment tool, but also as far as a skill sustainment uh, tool and what capabilities are um, out there to, to help us uh, do that. So yes, absolutely. We're interested in it. Um, I think there's still areas to develop it. Nothing compares to live tissue, um, but there are certain uh, areas that that virtual reality can be useful good uh, it's good to hear you all are striving towards that uh, uh when we reach the point that uh, it, it supersedes live tissue training uh that will be a welcome uh, i think from the general uh, uh populace i do want uh, i can't imagine uh uh having spent a career outside of army medicine but let me ask you what is the current status of army medical corps recruiting and retention I like how Jason sits back. <laughs> no, um, I, so recruiting and retention, I think General Dingle hit it on the head. It's a challenge um, and it's becoming a, a bigger challenge nationwide. There is a general shortage and it's going to get worse of healthcare providers and uh, healthcare staff. Uh, we are now seeing competition. Our, our main way of recruiting, uh, especially phys physicians into the army is through our HPSP scholarships and then partly through uses. Um, we now have civilian um, schools that are offering free tuition. We have civilian healthcare um, partners or um, systems that are offering free medical school tuition. We are competing for a very small population um, against, uh, and, it, and the pool is getting even smaller. We do have some initiatives ongoing for recruitment um, and retention. So, and then retention wise, it, I, again, General Dingle mentioned, you know, we just cannot pay what the civilian sector pays, um, especially in our subspecialty populations, our, our neurosurgeons, our orthopedic surgeons, our general surgeons. Um, I, we just we're, we're not competitive and can't be. Um, but they have most people have that desire to to serve. There's a reason. There's that mission that they join the army in the first place. And so how do we leverage that? But how do we get them that sets and reps? That's the number one reason why our docs actually leave the military is, is the sets and reps, um, the skills. The second one is pay. Um, and then where can we leverage the NDAA uh, 2020 increased our caps on our um, bonuses. While that was authorized, it wasn't necessarily appropriated. So we're still trying to work with what we need, um, what we can do with our current fi financial constraints, and then what um, we would like to do if we didn't have those financial constraints. Um, and that's just a little bit of what's going on with our recruitment and retention efforts. 
Uh, thank you. As we close up here, I'd like to give uh, our panelists uh, an opportunity to make closing remarks. Uh, we'll start with Colonel Holt. Sure, just a, just a couple of kind of summarizing points. You know, ultimately we want our MTFs, we need to start to, to move the needle and, and kind of shape shape the delivery of care, you know, tailored to match our uh, operational um, and combat casualty care mission. Uh, with that, you know, we have to sort of measure what matters and, you know, look at how do we translate this clinical workload, you know, whether it's, you know, through the, the KSA metric as part of the ICTLs, you know, to, to be able to do an appropriate risk assessment of where is the clinical currency and competency of our medical forces. Um, and then just lastly, you know, we need to leverage our, these military civilian partnerships are, are key to be able to bring in these national experts um, to maintain that, stand, that one standard of excellence across all of our medical forces. Uh, thank you, uh, Colonel Suri. Uh, thank you, General Carville, for letting us be part of this. I think what I, I would like to put out is that it's, um, for me, being around for over 30 years now, is that um, the, the one thing I really like about being in the military is um, the excitement and that it's fun to do stuff, in the, and we're, we're fixers, we're problem solvers. And over the last couple of years, we have actually been able to do critical and creative thinking. We've been able to be innovative and visionary uh, with the leadership listening, instead of us just having this in small groups uh, or working groups and stuff. And our leadership is actually interested in constantly querying us for these great ideas, outside the box ideas. And, uh, and we're able to implement many of them. Some we, we can't, we understand, but it's, it's a much different time. And while there's a lot of um, challenges going on, we, we try to communicate to the physicians that the leaders care and that this is actually a great time, if not the greatest time to be in military medicine, if you're a problem solver and you like challenges. And, and most of us in medicine, do. It's just you have to kind of look at the uh, situation from a different angle. Otherwise, it, it just seems like chaos. Cool. Uh, thank you, uh, Colonel Duffy. I, I don't know if I can uh, top that one. <laughs> um, no, I think over, yeah, we've all lived it the last several years. We have seen unprecedented change in MedCom and in our uh, military health system. Uh, there are complex problems. There's no easy solutions. If there were, they would have already been fixed. So the, we have had that opportunity to, to be innovative, um, to really try to tackle some of these. Um, we can't lose sight of um, our, our future obligations while we're doing our day-to-day -day operations. And as a non-surgeon, I'm gonna plug, it needs to be a holistic approach. We can't just focus on our surgery and our trauma. Um, we need to focus on the whole system and all of our diverse specialties. Um, I think, again, COVID has shown the value of our public health departments, um, our infectious disease doctors, our ICU docs and nurses. So um, it is a holistic team effort um, to keep the system running. Thank you. Thank you. Again, I want to thank the panelists uh, for your uh, subject matter expertise uh, and participation in this uh, panel. I want to thank AUSA uh, and uh, Generals Brown, Swan, uh, Dingle. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you uh, for those in attendance for your, uh, uh, your attention. Thank you.